In this video, I'm gonna walk you through the basics of a how to scan. It's gonna be really catered towards med students and residents. For more educational resources like our ICD HMP notebook, check out medicalbasics.com. So a broad overview, we're going to be talking about some of the normal and abnormal situations, some common clinical issues, and also go over some cases. So before we get started, what is a HIDA scan? A HIDA scan is a type of nuclear medicine study where we're giving some type of radio pharmaceutical, and that radio pharmaceutical has some affinity for certain organs. In this situation, it has an affinity to the gallbladder and the biliary system. So in a normal situation, you're going to see the liver is going to uptake, the gallbladder is going to uptake, and you're going to have uptake of the biliary system, both the extrahepatic and intrahepatic. And also you're going to have small bowel. And this situation is a little bit early, so we didn't see small bowel, but usually you will. In an abnormal situation, really the hallmark is in acute cholecystitis, absence of filling of the gallbladder. And so we'll do a variety of maneuvers to really ensure that we don't have uptake within the gallbladder. But the, the, the core of it is that we're going to have uptake within the liver. We're going to have uptake within the biliary system in small bowel, but we will not have any uptake within the gallbladder. And that's the hallmark of acute cholecystitis. What you can do is once you see uptake within the bowel and you know that the sphincter of ODI is patent, what you can do is you can give some morphine that essentially contracts the sphincter and allows there to be some back pressure. And hopefully with that back pressure, you'll have filling of the gallbladder. If you do have filling of the gallbladder, then you can exclude acute cholecystitis. And if you still don't have filling within the the gallbladder, then it's positive for acute cholecystitis. In chronic cholecystitis, it's a little bit different. So chronic cholecystitis is essentially chronic inflammation of the gallbladder. Unlike acute cholecystitis, in chronic cholecystitis, you'll have filling of the gallbladder, although it may be a little bit delayed. However, really the hallmark is that you're going to have delayed ejection fraction. So what does that mean? Ejection fraction, just like the heart, is how quickly radio tracer or any type of material within the gallbladder is able to be excreted after you stimulate it. And how we're going to be stimulating it is with CCK. CCK will contract the gallbladder and allow you to essentially expel everything from the gallbladder. So very simply, it's just going to be, we're going to be calculating what is the uptake, what are the counts within the gallbladder after we filled it. So that's time zero. We give CCK, so we now contract it, and we wait an hour, and we count it again, and we subtract those to get uh, essentially a percentage of how much was able to be excreted. And this situation went from about 1,000 down to 800, so we got an ejection fraction of 22%. So anything less than 35%, abnormal. That's going to be chronic cholecystitis. Anything above that is going to be typically normal. So I kind of alluded to some of this with, you know, morphine and CCK, but there are some clinical issues that you have to be aware of when you're ordering these tests and kind of timing it. One is there's a lot of coordination that is required, you know, both from a logistical and staff situation, but also in terms of what you're giving the patient. So opioids are something that can be very problematic in situations like this because you can imagine if a patient were given opioids fairly early before the exam, they're going to contract the, the, the sphincter. This will not only not allow you to have radio tracer going into the bowel, and that could be dangerous because you essentially cause an obstruction, but also you can have a falsely negative exam, right? You can have radio tracer going into the, the gallbladder, but really what you're worried about is you're now obstructing the sphincter, and in theory, that, that can be problematic. You essentially have all this back pressure and you can't excrete anything from, from the biliary system. So we don't like to have patients have opioids, which often they do because they're in a lot of pain, for at least a couple of hours and it'll vary by institution. The other thing is you want to make sure the patient's MPO. Everything is all about pressure, right? So if you eat a meal, the gallbladder will contract. And if that's the situation, it's going to be much easier for radio tracer to go in. Likewise, if you haven't had a meal in a long time, you know, you're going to have a very dilated, distended gallbladder, and that would preferentially not want radio tracer to go in, right? It's all about pressure. You want to go to the path of least resistance. If you if your gallbladder is really distended, has really high pressure, well, it's not going to want to, radio tracer is not going to want to go into the gallbladder and you're going to get a falsely positive exam in that situation. So really what the takeaway is, there's a, there's a golden zone. You want to be not MPO for too long and not MPO for too short. So you just want to talk with your radiologist to figure out what that time point is. 
we kind of alluded to this in the last slide, but there's a there's a balance with all of this. You want to make sure that you're not giving opioids prior to the exam or also not having the patient be MPO too far or too soon before the exam. And the reason why is because opioids are going to contract the sphincter voli. So there's this, this theoretical risk that if you contract the sphincter and it's completely contracted, then you'll have all this back pressure and you're essentially causing an obstruction when you're giving all this radial tracer and it's just going to kind of pile up within the liver. The other downside is you could potentially cause a falsely negative exam because, you know, contract or a radio tracer is going to go into the gallbladder when it wouldn't have otherwise wanted to. The other situation is your MPO status. So every time you eat a meal, your gallbladder is going to contract. So your gallbladder has to be not too distended because if it's too distended, everything's all about pressure. If it's going to, the radio tracer is going to be wanting going down the path of least resistance. If the gallbladder is too distended, then there's going to be too high of a pressure here. Radio tracer is just going to completely bypass the gallbladder, even if you're not having acute cholecystitis, simply from the pressure of food or sorry of, of bile because you ha you haven't had a meal in a long time. It's going to cause you to have a positive HIDA scan, and the, the reverse can be true as well. So in these situations, we could give cholest CCK to kind of contract the gallbladder and then wait if, if they're MPO. But really, you want to talk with your radiologist in order to have the optimal timing in terms of how early or how late since they've been MPO and also timing of opioids. We typically like to not wait or not give opioids a couple hours prior to the exam. Now, we have a few cases of HIDAs that are kind of unique. Acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis, that's going to be your bread and butter. The most common reason why you're going to be ordering for a, for a HIDA scan. However, this is one situation, gangrenous cholecystitis. If you can see, you have this sloth membranes in the ultrasound, kind of have this asymmetric wall, and you, you have all this uh, stones and sludge within the gallbladder. But you can actually see this on HIDA, and what, what the sign is is this rim sign. I don't know if you can appreciate this, but you can see kind of this rim of activity in the gallbladder fossa around the inferior hepatic lobe, but you don't see any uptake within the gallbladder itself. So if you have no uptake within the gallbladder, that's already by definition definition, acute cholecystitis, but you also have this rim of activity around it. Gangrenous cholecystitis is much more severe than acute cholecystitis and requires much more immediate attention. And so this is a situation that would be a little bit more unique that you would want to act on it sooner. And gangrenous cholecystitis, if you remember, is due to essentially necrosis of the gallbladder wall. The next case is going to be a bile leak. And so what you have in this situation, I, I think this was a trauma patient, is you have all this activity outside of the biliary system and the bowel. This is along the you know left lateral wall in the peritoneum. Right. So what we have is we have liver uptake and then we probably have some biliary uptake. And then now we have this linear focus that's not really going where it should be. And then we ha eventually have bowel. And where that linear focus is going, it goes now to this very diffuse uptake along the left lateral abdominal wall. So you know, the bowel uptake is normal, the uptake within the biliary system normal, and in the liver it's normal, but you should not have uptake all along the, um, you know, peritoneum. So this is an example of bile leak. Uh, you may want to get it after, you know, trauma, after some surgery, like a transplant or some cholecystectomy if the patient is not getting better. The next example is a biliary atresia. This, you know, really only going to be dealing with this in kids. But if you are a pediatrician, what you will be seeing is you'll, you'll be seeing rapid uptake within the liver, right? We see very intense rapid uptake within the liver very early on, but you don't see anything else. This, these are the, actually the kidneys. So you're having renal excretion both in the kidneys and also in the bladder. However, you don't see any biliary uptake. You don't see uptake within small bowel. You don't see uptake within the gallbladder essentially because the patient doesn't have bowel ducts. And so that's that's an example of biliary atresia. And then the final example I wanted to give you was a biliary obstruction. So this, if you notice, you'll have some uptake within liver, you have uptake within the bile ducts, and you also have uptake within the gallbladder, but it kind of just stops, right? So I don't see any uptake within bowel. I just see it stop right here. And no matter how long you wait, this in this situation, they waited two hours. And you still don't see any uptake in, within bowel, but you still see it, the same uptake where we were seeing early on. So this is an example of a biliary obstruction. Essentially, if you have an obstruction, of the, you know, in this situation, probably the CVD, then you will not have any tracer going into the bowel. So there can be varieties of this. You can have a, a high obstruction, you have a lower obstruction, and depending on that, you may or may not have any uptake within the gallbladder, but you definitely shouldn't have any uptake within bowel if there's ability obstruction. 
Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our progress notebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons. Thank you.